Good morning, everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is Umu Pajaro Velasquez. I'm the chair of the Gender Standing Group. And this network session is made as part of the uh, efforts of the Gender Standing Group from Internet Society to expand the vision beyond the binary model of gender that we're having uh, seen right now on, in, on the internet governance ecosystem. Uh, this networking session is going to be about how the difference uh, actually born as a concern of mine or how during the pandemic the social media uh, started to um, started to ban uh, more the content related to queer and LGBTQI people and why they do that because uh, actually was because the automated decision tools that actually uh, supposed to pass through a human uh, verification but never get a reply of why your content is banned when actually the content is so similar to another content that it was presented by a, a person that is straight or, or, or is inside of what is normal. So the so inside of the different platform we were seeing that there were a uh, discrimination and a uh, uh, there were a uh, systematic ban of content related to LGBTQI people and non-binary folks. So uh, related to this topic, we uh, uh, we invite to talk. Uh, uh, Jenny Olson, she is the senior director of GLAC, a uh, social, media, social media safety program. Jenny Olson uh, leads the organization platform accountability, uh, where it's providing new and existing issues facing LGBTQI social media users in real time, both directly to platforms and to the press and public. Advocating for solutions in numerous realms, online hate and harassment, AI bias, polarizing algorithms, uh, data privacy, working uh, every day, uh, she's working every day to hold platform accountable and to secure safety, privacy and expression in online spaces for LGBTQI people. Uh, she's going to present like a model of how to measure the ban of LGBTQI people that she applied in the case of the United States. Uh, I find the, the investigation and her methodology quite uh, interesting and probably uh, want to replicate around the world. <laughs> uh, or, or we have another speaker. Is Teresa Kuhl. She's from Brazil. She's, a, she's currently an undergraduate from the Federal University of Minas Gerais. As a, 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 she's a mediator, educator, a teacher of English and Portuguese. Is a, a trans activist and independent speaker for the LGBTQIP plus Brazilian community in governmental and public events such as the National Day of Combat to Homophobia in the National Public Health System, SUS, and the National Pride of Trans and Travestis uh, in Brazil. Uh, also, we host today uh, uh, is Veronica Piccolo doing the rapporteur. She is a member of the UD organizing committee, the UIGF Italia, and the chair of the Internet Society U Standing Group. And uh, doing the moderation online will be Enul Camiro. She he is in Japan and trying to remember the university <laughs> where he is, and myself, Umu Pajaro Velasque, chair of the Gender Standing Group. As we see seeing right now online, Teresa, Teresa, could you please, could you please take the floor and start your uh, exposition? Uh, sure. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, oh my god. Oh my god. Um, uh, 
Um, are you guys seeing my oh, sorry this We will see any more. You need to share it again. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now we see you now. Now you guys see me. Okay. Uh. First, let me excuse for the problems in uh, asserting my. Is it? Are you guys? Is it changing right now? Yes. Okay. So, what I'm, I'm about to talk is uh, I'm about to talk about raising sensibility and solving the problem one step at a time. So let us ask ourselves, what is diversity? The definition has had recent changes. And um, I think my computer is not handling it. Okay. Technical problems, I'm sorry. Okay, so the definition has had recent changes. Uh, changes to include uh, first starting with disabilities, then progressing to cultural differences and getting on where we are today, also including sexuality and gender in a broad form, not only about the LGBTQ plus community. And What is diversity to the LGBTQA plus community? We believe that the, uh, the diversity for us is the right to explore being different, free, healthy, and respected. And that has everything to do about what we're dealing with today in um, Extreme and violent exposures of bad, uh, bad, uh, bad sentiment against uh, the LGBT community, and at the same time, a lot of exposure through uh, sometimes deemed harmful uh, media, and also, uh, also the problem in. dealing with social media, it, which is our main focus, that we haven't had much space to express ourselves. And the only, the only biggest spaces that we are uh, chancellor-less okay are what is expected to us in, uh, in the evil eye uh, or in the evil view. which is um, uh, not uh, not living uh, or not living our lives, but living in promiscuity. That's what is expected to a lot of the internet users as of today. And that represents my uh, experience in Brazil on how much uh, we deal with the stigma of being Uh, different and so we are often fetishized we are often um, uh, talked against our wishes slurred and many other problems that it is discussed not as we wanted to but th there is no need to elongate further So, let 
let's talk about what are uh, what are our attempts at talking, which we know is hard, and we, I say the community, and it is new for every kind of spaces, and groundbreaking solutions aren't in effect. And I like to ask, just so you guys can think about it, what are the most common solutions do the general public knows and they're not the general public often ha have to put up with uh the banning and restriction restriction of words so banning what are the effects of banning first of all and the most immediate effect is lead speaking which is typing like this to getting away with typing slurs like fag, die, tranny, and so on. Also, there are wrongful and bans and restrictions to LGBTQA plus community using said reclaimed slurs, even though when using lead speaking, because you can still uh, Denounce to the administrate to administrators of content in Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, which is very uh, recurrent here in Brazil, the platform. And but even though there's a, just a meager progress, is understandable. We've talked. I've uh, personally talked with Jenny about this the profiling of who can say it or not those reclaimed slurs and how they say that is not desirable we need um a development in the understanding of diversity and the reassurance that, that Teresa, we can lose refer the sound. to we lose uh, sound for us without for a moment. having to. Sorry, where was I? Yes, we heard the, the part of profiling who can say or no is, is not desirable, but then, then for around 30 seconds, we lose you. Okay. Uh, we, we need to have a we we know that we need to have a better understanding of what is diversity how is important and why should everyone respect it and that exceeds the um, role of facebook and other social medias instagram and now twitter cool and hiding the problem will not make it go and it's meant to be a palliative solution. Uh, but why do we most, uh, why do we mostly only hear of these uh, implementations? Why we stopped at only restricting and do not go further? That is a question that is still unresolved, but we can, talk about the way, gay way of doing things, which is resisting and making space where we can grow and better protect ourselves. That is also an important point. The, uh, what we call here in Brazil, aquilombações, which were, is a term by the, uh, often said by the black community that is holding yourself as a group and developing better ways of reaching the general public and reaching the government, the civil society, the, the companies and so on. And more about the difficulty of talking uh, over our reality is the difficulty of talking inside classes and many more public spaces. 
And here I use classes because there is a limit on research and active voices denouncing uh, or sharing our views on the matter. And I work as a teacher and a, I am a pre-service teacher, which means that we deal a lot with the problem of talking about diversity inside classes and extending to other public spaces where we experiment violent and legal sometimes backlash in form of laws that prohibit uh, even talking or speaking about uh, the matter. And my studies revolve around, revolve around raising awareness in the acting profession. The acting professional is uh, what we know of the professional who has to deal with the public, be it at the back seat or the front seat. So attendants, but also coders. What they need to know? They need to know our voice. And why do you need to know? It's a question to also elicit in your mind. Why are LGBTQ a plus diversity is important to talk about? And by within this uh, broader framework, there is this study in the Lunenburg University, uh, which the graduation teacher or professor uh, gave a class, a, a discipline that was about raising awareness in the acting professional. And at the end of the semester, conclusions were drawn that it's hard to change people's minds, but it's also a the ve own development process. So it is not immediate as we want to, and we as a group has to hold on to each other. And the, what, what we say, the allies could help us holding on to each other. And more than that, the, Close responses or this this talk and so why how do why how and why and when do I talk about it? The 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 class was all about problems that weren't exactly uh, evident that it was about an issue of prejudice, but it also had a way of raising raising awareness on on the matter so there isn't a need to talk directly about it but there needs to be a space so uh to work in a broader view of elements because there are many cultures who do not condone uh our existence and they are very violent about it but there's still way to make do to um, reach uh, a common ground where we can uh, have tolerance without uh, violence and with dialogue. And only a minority of students in this experiment showed a total lack of awareness about the matter. So, it is efficient, although not direct. That is for the viewer to apply or to think about in their practices. We know that we are dealing with all sorts of different, different professions. So how do I bring up this in the office? How I, as a manager, can bring this up in the office? Uh, how I, as a chair in a community group or a chair in a government space, how can I address the matter without having to take a stand of being 
uh, radical, even though you are being radical about it because advocating for change, it's often not seen uh, in the general public and in the government or enterprises. Only representation is, is seen, but representation isn't all of it. We need to be active professionals in the change. And uh, whether we, whether we as, L as LGBTQA plus community or we as allies. And uh, so the conclusion is that we need are that we need to reach the user, but the professional behind the code. The user and the professional behind the code is also a metaphor for other spaces that exceed the social medias because that is the problem. There is a ceiling where social medias can make their part. And we as a group, as a community, worldwide community, have to tackle the problem. And few initiatives are known as uh, uh, and that it is urgent to stop the wrongful ban on those accounts that use the reclaim slurs. But still, uh, this is this is also a um, very reasonable uh, matter, actually, to solve inside the company. Are the administrators banning what they see on, on like, they're just batting an eye and they're just, like, reaching for it and immediately saying, no, this is wrong. It has a wrong word. And they are not reaching for the context of it in, uh, after, to, after applying or before applying their um, their justice. And there must be more spaces to exercise a right to be different, healthy, and respected. Uh, free, healthy, and respected. Thank you. This was my presentation. And uh, we are going with Jenny and a round of questions and, then, and answers. Uh, thank you, Teresa, for your, uh, your insightful exposition about how this uh, this stereotype, the, the stereotypes or different bias actually are a reflection of what is happening in the real world and um, and a replication into the so, um, into the social social media. Now the floor is your journey to speak a, about a little more about this. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jenny Olson from GLAD, uh, the uh, US-based LGBTQ media advocacy organization. Um, uh, thank you, Teresa, um, and great to be here. Um, and um, so so I want to talk a little bit about our, uh, our work. We have the, the GLAD uh, social media safety program um, is our uh, tech and platform accountability initiative um, focused on, we're primarily focused on um, monitoring and advocating uh, for LGBTQ um, safety, privacy, and expression um, in relation to the five major media, uh, social media platforms. Um, so uh, Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok. Um, and uh, we work on a variety of things um, as, as you had referenced in the, the intro, um, uh, ranging from uh, algorithmic bias, uh, AI bias, um, uh, data privacy, uh, but the the bulk of our work is around um, anti LGBTQ hate um, and uh, particularly around um, high follower 
accounts that are uh, kind of really hate accounts that are devoted to uh, perpetuating uh, bigotry and um, uh, disinformation or otherwise known as lies <laughs> about LGBTQ people. Um, and, and, you know, particularly, uh, particularly here in the U.S., um, as a pretext for uh, uh, ret retracting LGBTQ rights. Um, I mean, this is true internationally as well. Um, uh, and um, I think, you know, th this is happens in, in general media, but, but particularly is uh, uh, rampant on social media and is... Um, heightened the, the spread of the all of this is is heightened via social media and so you know we're working a lot about looking at the policies of the platforms both encouraging them to develop better policies but also to enforce their existing policies um and here in the u.s in particular um a lot of that is about uh is about looking at uh slurs and um, anti-LGBT slurs and urging the platforms to uh, mitigate that harm or particularly to take things down um, that are in violation of uh, of those the, the hate speech policies. Um, uh, and I we also work on the flip side of that, which I think Teresa, you were referring to a bit in in your presentation about um, the the flip side of that of uh, LGBT users and uh, being disproportionately censored, um, having accounts taken down, having um, uh, our self-expression taken down or censored. Um, and um, I think, you know, on the one hand, we recognize that, you know, these are challenging decisions and there it's a challenging thing that so much responsibility is put on, you know, private companies to decide, you know, what's okay to be, you know, to be posted on these platforms. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, it's always going to be imperfect um and yet um obviously it could be much more uh there's there's a lot of room for improvement um so uh and you know in particular so just to talk a little bit about the you know the anti-lgbtq hate um you know, we, we see so much um, the consequences of, and specifically the consequences of this intense anti-LGBT rhetoric um, on social media translating to, you know, real world harm. Um, uh, probably people heard about, you know, last month, um, the mass shooting in Bratislava, uh, outside the, or at the gay bar in Bratislava, um, two people died and, um, two people were injured. Um, and the, the, um, the person who the shooter had posted extensively on his Twitter account, um, you know, terrible anti-LGBT and other horrible things. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, the shooting that just happened a couple of weeks ago here um, in Colorado, uh, whatever, where we don't know, there's a lot of things we don't know about that yet, but um, but we we see, you know, series of, of uh, uh, protests from extremists or extremists showing up at gay events um, uh, repeatedly that are 
related to activities that are happening on on social media platforms. Um, anyway, we could spend an hour talking about that, but um, uh, but but so so I spend a lot of my days at work um, dealing with all of that and um, and particularly trying to. Uh, uh, you know, advocate with the platforms to do a better job at mitigating that hateful content. Um, um, let's see, I, I wanted to talk about, um, you know, so yeah, this this kind of sense of, of the real world harm of that hate. Um, uh, <clears throat> it's an interesting, time right now um i mean one of one of the other things that we talk about a lot is about the need for some kinds of regulatory oversight and um you know because glad is just a civil society organization we are trying to urge these companies to you know voluntarily uh do a better job and and there's you know the entire field of uh uh, platform accountability and trust and safety and content moderation professionals, um, you know, working on these issues and developing best practices and, um, uh, but and but in, in increasingly there are regulatory um, consequences for the companies um, and particularly more uh, in other other parts of the world, particularly the EU, um, has had, uh, you know, is, is much farther along particularly than the US is. Um, and uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening right now with Twitter, of course, um, and uh, crazy stuff. Um, but, um, so we, uh, you know, whatever we're trying to, you know, stay involved with, um, uh, being involved with that kind of advocacy work around uh, regulatory solutions. Um, and let's see, I mean, I so, so then I guess the last thing that I'll just uh, say is, uh, so the, the big, we we produce an annual report, the Social Media Safety Index, and um, this past year's report, we uh, we actually rate the platforms on a number of uh, of indicators that we developed with um, ranking digital rights, uh, looking at a variety of aspects of of uh, uh, platform policies. And in this last year's report, uh, on a scale of one to a hundred, all of the platforms failed, like fell under a fifty. Um, uh, they're not doing a great job. Um, and you know, so again, as a civil society organization, all we can do is say, you know, here is our, you know, we're we're evaluating them. We're making recommendations. Um, we're and then we're you know trying to call attention to these problems, um, and you know to a certain degree, uh, you know by shedding that light on uh, what you know what they're doing wrong and where they can improve, uh, the hope is that uh, they will, you know, voluntarily make some of those improvements, um, uh, and. I just to, I'll just point to like one of our successes last year, one of our significant successes was um, a recommendation around um, policies around conversion therapy content um, and, uh, you know, which so uh, conversion therapy has been, um, you know, uh, acknowledged by the UN to be, uh, you know, considered a form of torture um and and yet it is a uh practice that continues to be 
widely promoted across social media. And, you know, we, we our recommendation was that uh, the social media platform policies should prohibit, uh, prohibit that. And we did uh, succeed in getting TikTok actually to implement a, um, a ban on content that is promoting conversion therapy, um, which on the one hand is this, you know, it's a very small thing and yet is a, is a really huge thing um, to get, you know, to get these huge companies to, to make changes like that. Um, and um, anyway, so we have many, you know, large and small achievements like that. Um, and I think um, the thing that I hold on to and uh, as we're, you know, trying to make a difference is the overarching idea that we all deserve to feel safe on social media and in the world. And, um, you know, that is really our mission. Um, and anyway, I think that's, that's uh, what I want to say. There's much more to say, but... Um, I hope people will um, come and check out uh, our more information about us at, at glad.org. Um, and yeah, and I'm curious to talk with folks. And, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, uh, it's really interesting how both of you, Jenny and Teresa, touch the topic of how the social media reality translate to the real world reality for saying in that way. How these two uh, are actually converging into one and how the bias and the different stereotypes that the, that the LGBTQI population and us is experimenting is translating and expanding one to another. So in order to having that in count oh, and what Teresa and Jenny said, if you have any question, any comment that you want, would you would like to make, you are more free to do to do it now because this is the time for Q and A and comments for the people here on site or online if there are any comment or questions. Um, right. I my, should also just my name is Gabriel, oh, yeah. and I, it's not a question but a comment. I'm Gabriel from Nigeria. I just want to say that um, uh, regarding, so uh, the first speaker talked about um, bringing down of um, uh, handles on social media. So I wanted to say that um, I've, I've, the organization I represent, or both of them, have they done comprehensive research on why these accounts are being taken down? You know, sometimes it's not the um, the platform themselves that take it down, but individuals go ahead to report these this handles. So in the end, uh, they take down this um, this this account. Then on the other hand, is to say that sometimes uh, I think uh, one of the things that we employed by this organization is to say that um, looking at the policies of the platforms, uh, most of them do not um, encourage violence against people on their platform. So uh, if there are, I, I'm just suggesting that if, uh, if works could be done on like storytelling to engage uh, people of um, LGBTQ people to understand um, the effect of uh, what they've experienced online and how that, how that can be trickled into um, marrying those effects with what the platform said they will be doing to how those platforms are not representing the perspective of these uh, minority people. And so that in the end, you have, um, you have content to back it that this is what you want, this is what you are saying in your policies, but this is not reflecting in, on how people who are using this platform are, are engaging in. So if, uh, if those stories can be 
accumulated and also it could inform future policies by the government or by people um, who are working. It could be government, it could be CSOs, it could be platforms. Thank you. Just a comment. Uh, um, I think Jenny can say something about that, right? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, um, <laughs> I, that, thank you for, well, I'll just respond to the, the piece about, um, you know, this kind of inconsistency between what the platforms say and that, you know, they do, they have all these policies and they, they say, um, particularly like I, I'm working on a project right now, uh, so, so many of the policies, they literally say, um, YouTube does not, allow, you know, hate speech is not allowed on YouTube. Um, Facebook does not allow hate speech. Um, and then, you know, but in reality, the reality is they do. And admittedly, it's, you know, it's difficult. It's not always super easy to, to, you know, look at speech and say like, that's hate speech. That's not. Um, but in our experience, there's a lot that is very clear and that you can, you know, I, I was the one example two years ago, I was hassling YouTube that they, they had a video that had been up for two years it had millions of views and the description used a very clear anti-trans slur. And I had repeated exchanges with actual people at YouTube, high up people at YouTube saying, this is totally, you know, horrible anti-trans hate, take it down. It's, it's in violation of your policies. I had five different exchanges with them. They replied back, no, 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 it's not in violation. It's not in violation. It's fine. And then finally on the fifth one, they were like, oh, okay, you're right. <laughs> and they took it down. Um, and, um, you know, and so stuff like that is like, that illustrates that, yeah, no, there, there is this um, total disconnect. But, but the thing is like that, and that is what our report does and we point it out and we have a zillion different news stories and and say you know this is you know wrong and there is this conflict and um anyway the problem with the platforms is that they're you know these massive multi-billion dollar companies and they i mean in certain ways they don't care i mean well they don't they are not held accountable. Um, and I think that's why we kind of advocate for that there have to be some regulatory as an industry that it, the industry needs to be regulated so that there are, you know, particularly financial consequences that would eventually cause them to actually be accountable. Um, anyway, that's sorry, that's a little bit of a long res response to your comment, but. Um, well, um, I would like to say something about that because recently at the May uh, research uh, around that topic and in showing that the that there was contradiction in the narrative or inclusion inside of TikTok and Meta. Um, and then my result were that actually they say the, the politics, uh, they are the promote diversity and inclusion, but actually when it comes to moderate the contents, uh, mm -mm, they aren't promoting inclusion and diversity in pretty much nothing. <laughs> Only if you become in some way mainstream inside of the platform and you get like, uh, you get, you start to gain profit from the platform and make profit to the platform, so do con your content start to be noticed. So, the uh, so for them is pretty much about money than actually being inclusive or diverse inside of the platforms, and that's a problem because most of the content that that is published by LGBTQI people actually are so specific 
and so <laughs> from a niche, they probably they don't want to make a lot of profit because they are so direct to a specific population that doesn't represent the majority of the world. So that creates that some problem. And even remember something similar that actually Jenny told, uh, talking with the representative for Latin America from Meta about the politics on, the, on diversity and and using all the discourse or diversity is 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 the backbone on all, all, all social media. See that we had these guy these cases or some pop, or some content creators that were pop that they became popular and start to make a career or something like that inside all the platforms. And um, and then I showed them all the different interviews that I made around all Latin America of people doing similar content, but they weren't taking down their account several times just for using a, a, a work that for them is a slur, but actually is a reclaim slur. The reclaim slur means that we empower that word and change the, the significance. And they take it down because it was mostly not someone that doesn't have enough followers. I don't know if is there a question or a comment in the in, in the chat or in the main room or, or Teresa, do you want to say something? Um, Elder raise his hand. I would like. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead, Lisa. Uh, I can ask later if you have something to say. Uh, that uh, that the notion of also social media, uh, it's often uh, reserved to the biggest so the the, uh, the biggest of the social medias. But uh, there are also uh, social medias that allow uh, the usage of words uh, without restriction. And depending on others to point the finger and take down a uh, said comment or content. And to give an example are the uh, image boards and Reddit that uh, a lot of the, uh, when they were pressed to make a uh, uh, organization of regulations uh, about uh, the limits of speech. Uh, they immediately banned thousands and thousands of uh, threads, which amount to uh, all the thousands or millions of people uniting to speak on a common ground about prejudice, but not in a good way, but in a very menacing way. And they were pressed because those same groups were, uh, were being related to actual criminal activity outside of uh, the violation of our rights. Uh, and so they were taking down uh, in very easily and they were taking down in uh, assertively. They didn't make any mistakes about it and uh, meaning that they know the existence of such groups uh, and there is an allowance for them to radical uh, conservative groups to uh, also uh, have their chance of grouping up and gaining strength. So um, that is just a comment that we also have to have in mind that uh, there are social medias in porn sites. There are social medias uh, that allows uh, other content that would be deemed not friendly friendly and 
that is sometimes also weaponized against us and it's hard it's largely weaponized against us that's my um may i uh comment on that which i, I mean it, it's interesting that I, so much of what we work on is the major sites and um and you know that the the the, the the way that there are three different kind of models of content moderation. One is, and I think, and that one is referred to as industrial. Um, and, you know, which is obviously these like massive companies, massive sites. Um, but I think kind of what you're talking about, Teresa, um, is, uh, what's it called? Um, artisanal. <laughs> um, uh, and or, or um, um, you know, uh, community uh, monitoring or community, you know, kind of like self moderating. And there, it is an interesting thing that like in communities like Reddit and like typically there's the sense that historically Reddit used to be really bad. And then um, in the last couple of years, there were kind of improvements in terms of the way that that the community itself is moderating things. And, and um, you know, there's a lot to be said for that as a model of, and like, you know, if you think about whatever kind of a more ideal version of our society of having, um, uh, you know, values and expectations of how people should behave, <laughs> And that that we like, hey, I know, let's all just be like kind to each other. And like, um, and if someone, you know, is mean, that other people are like, hey, don't do that. You're being mean. That's not okay. Or that these are not our um our shared values as a community. And that the community itself can, yeah, um, you know, moderate those things. Um, anyway, and it, it's it's just a nice thing to to think about. You know, these kind of other models. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, there is a space for one intervention. So. Uh... Thank you. Um, my question was on one of the, I guess. Um, positive things that was celebrated, I guess this year was that TikTok uplifted the ban. And I'm kind of curious as to why TikTok specifically, um, sorry if I'm mistaken on this, but TikTok is based in China and the way they um, have their platform set up in China versus US is very different. Um, there's been a couple articles and uh, research done on that. So I'm kind of curious to investigate why specifically TikTok. Um, yeah, I guess there's a um, multiple part of question. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly say, I mean, I, I'm not familiar with that piece of that, uh, of, um, them being different in China and here, or what you know, what what that, what those differences are. Um, it, it's an interesting thing. The different companies and their kind of um, the culture of the companies and TikTok is kind of the most different in terms of its culture of the way that they deal with things. And part of that is that um, you know Meta and YouTube and Twitter, obviously are you know come out of silicon valley here and it's just very um kind of libertarian ethos and obviously tiktok is very different as a chinese company um and but it's interesting there's sort of pros and cons or positives and negatives of that uh i i mean it was surprising in certain ways that when we asked tiktok to um to implement the conversion therapy ban like i literally did it in an email in an almost kind of casual way and they 
they replied and they were like, sure, <laughs> we'll do that. And <clears throat> I was kind of surprised. And I mean, it was, it was really great, but there was also the piece of it, the, whatever the downside of that was like, I was sort of like, really, you're just like, just that easily decided to make this huge policy change. Um, and you know, the, the, the downside of that and, and, um, there was a thing that we reported on in the first report about um, some, you know, so the downside of that is like, oh yeah, well, TikTok also in a um, couple of years ago in um, Arabic speaking countries, you know, some, uh, you know, the authorities were like, let's have it be that you can't say the word gay in Arabic. And TikTok was like, okay. <laughs> Um, you know, and so that's the the flip side, the downside that um, to have, you know, companies just being like getting to, um, yeah, and, and I, sorry, just, you know, so the, the thing about Twitter historically is that as a company, their culture has been the most um, immersed in a, a real human rights framework like a like in a way that you know to ha to 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 find to to guide their policies um through a human rights lens and like looking at like what are all of the implications of of how how policies can be used or abused by governments by uh you know and and how things impact society in general um obviously twitter is a very different place today than it was you know a month ago um due to elon musk and his you know sacking of the entire human rights um department um but uh, anyway but it is interesting the kind of cultural differences in the companies Well, uh, well, the time has over for this session and really grateful to the ones that assisted here on site and the ones that were online and also to other speakers that both of them in, in the other side of the world in America. So probably they are in really early in the morning. So then thanks to you for being at this hour uh, and give us your insight of, of this really important matter. Thank you so much.